It's trap season, bro. Kill the king. Kill the king. He got your neck and won't let go. Kill the king. Kill the king. Kill the king. He got your neck and won't let go. Kill the king. You wanted no limits, though. Then take up the limit, bro. Your idol is king. He got your reflections. You were in his ring and got us a no go. Kill the king. Too many cooks in the kitchen. Kill the king. He got your neck and won't What's up, everybody? It's your girl Saria's voice here. And um, I have a special guest with me today. Before I introduce my special guest, uh, during this four-part series dubbed When Christians Work with Mainstream, where I delve into the particulars of working with mainstream producer Trey Tracks on my latest single called Kill the King. Today, we want to focus on the way the church sees mainstream music. The, just the way they, they, they think about it, they operate, they, they, they respond to it. Um, at times for me personally, as an independent artist, it's been a struggle. It's been a bit of a tug of war. I've had moments where I've had a microphone snatched out of my hand and that was hurtful. I've had moments where I've had to remove myself from a stage. My husband had to turn the camera off, professional camera, um, because he's watching everything go down. And so it's sad to say, but <laughs> we had to come to this place where I have to expound on those little clips, maybe a few years ago, you guys have seen through my documentary, Rap Queen, the series voice story, where I talk about that particular instance where someone thought I was doing the devil's music, even though I had explained the song. But I believe they were triggered. The church pastor, the pastor of the church, the, the, the ministers, the evangelists, the prayer warriors, everybody was, everybody that was summoned to that stage, to remove the microphone, to turn the music off, to escort me out of the building because I was doing the devil's music. There's a lot of things that we don't understand as the church. Um, but I believe that the beat that I used, which was a secular beat, triggered something. I believe that the sound, just the overall sound triggered something. And see, sometimes we have these preconceived notions about things that just isn't there. And so even though a Christian rapper who is saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, you know the whole thing, would explicitly say, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus Christ. I am about all things God, all things Christ. I am about the Bible. I am about pushing kingdom forward. No matter how much you say, no matter how much you recite the 66 books from the Bible, somehow when that when when the DJ hits play or spin on that instrumental or on that track, it everything goes to hell. So, I've invited my husband um, of 18 plus years. We've known each other for 19. And he'll, he'll correct me if, if, if I'm wrong. We've known each other for 19 years. We've been married 18 years. We're coming up on another amazing anniversary. I feel like I, I got married. I blinked my eyes and here we are eight, 18, 19 years later with a 15 year old and all these things that God has allowed us to accomplish. But he's been around for the long haul and he understands and he can speak. I don't just want to, I don't want you guys to feel like I'm making up these stories or I'm trying to trump up something that's not there. This is what it is. I've had microphones snatched from me. I've had people kick me out of situations because they thought I was doing the devil's music. So here we are talking about when Christians work with mainstream. Welcome to this four part series, Mr. C Live, who is now a two-time McDonald's Gospel Fest finalist. He's a vocalist. He sings, as you guys know, 
Um, but he doesn't just sing. He is a minister of the gospel. He is a DJ, a Christian DJ. He is the head of Serious People Music, which is an independent label based here in New York City. He manages myself. He manages other artists. He has worked with a number of successful, award-winning, award-nominated artists for over 10 years. Mr. C, welcome. And let's get right into it. Thank you for having me, Serious Voice. And I... Appreciate being here. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, so let's loosen up a little bit. I'm sipping on my coffee, of course. Um, my hot French vanilla latte that I made myself. And so let's just loosen up a little bit. Let's backtrack to the day we were in the studio and you and Mr. L, my other producer, shout out to Mr. L, More Beats Brooklyn. Um, you and Mr. L had a robust conversation. Can I say robust? Yeah, conversation. Sure. And we were wrapping up the beautiful deluxe album. It was Memorial Day and we're all packed in the studio. Me, you, Mr. L. I believe I believe Jerry was there. I believe I or maybe no, Jerry was not there. The the, the commissioner the commissioner. The commissioner was not there. But I remember that it was, it, I was there, you were there, and Mr. L were there. So it was the three of us. It just seemed like it was a, it was a lot of us in the room because things were starting to heat up. Mm. And Mr. L, and, and I love, I love Mr. L for this because Mr. L has a way of, he'll listen to you talk. He'll listen to your music. He'll go through this. We'll have a whole round table discussion and he'll say one thing. He'll be like, why don't you make the phone call? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. we talked about we talked about adding, well, I talked about adding an extra element to really kind of provoke people with the beautiful deluxe. And then you cavalierly mention, oh yeah, you know, I know someone that knows Trey Tracks. Maybe that's a possibility, right? Mr. L turns around from his chair, right? He says, why don't you make the call? Well, it, let's, it wasn't that clean, but <laughs> 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 but first of all, before I even get it, you know, why she's sipping this, uh, you know, cup of uh, latte? Yes, you know, I just gotta say one thing, and it's a shameless plug. But anytime you're drinking your coffee, your latte, you can always play. Coffee time, and you know what it is. <laughs> so check that track out. Anyway, um, well, anyway. well, let's add to that yeah. the coffee time song that he just sang a little snippet of. Coffee time is actually my podcast. It's everywhere, so be sure to check it out. So let's yeah. So down. we're we're actually and, and and the great thing about it is great things happen on holidays. It's Memorial Day weekend last year. Right. So, uh, we stopped at the studio to check Mr. L out. I'm not sure if it was about... It was an early morning studio yeah. session. Oh, I think you know what it is? I think we were trying to finalize the Beautiful Deluxe um, project. Right. That's what right. I mentioned. So, basically, yes. um, we go in there um, and we actually start talking about, uh, uh, you know, adding a track, you know, maybe a bonus track or something. Right. To to really make the, the project stand out. So we start talking about um beats, who we're gonna get the beat from, this, that, and the third. And um, you know, I said I am connected to, you know, someone that, you know, knows Trey Tracks. Basically you said I, I got this person's right. number in I, my I, phone. I, I, I have the person's number in my phone. And I could call them and I, yada yada yada. So, so L is stop. like he stopped and he stopped his track. <laughs> and he looked at me. And he basically got on my case. I'm not sure if he said some, um, you know, some choice well, words. Well, we're, we're keeping it family so, friendly. But he was like, man, how you going to have that contact and not engage in a conversation? Because I wanted to leave right there. I'm like, you know, I don't like really like forcing, you know, just because I have relationships with people, I don't like working them like that just because. It has to make sense. And I'm in between this back and forth. And right? I just, I eased myself so out. So we're going and back and forth. Allowed- I allowed these two men to have their conversation. And at the end of the conversation, we came to the conclusion, the three of us, that this is a good idea. So then Mr. C picks up the phone right there in the studio. He calls 
the manager, the tra- yep. Trey Tracks' manager, yep, uh, or or one of them, uh, the connect to Trey Tracks, and the connect basically said, "Hold on one second, I'll call you right back. I'll call him right now." This is Memorial uh, a Monday morning time. Nobody is talking. I, you you you're not gonna find too many people doing music that hour of the morning. No way. It's usually they're getting home from the studio at that hour of the morning. So. The contact calls Trey Tracks. They talk. We don't know what the exchange was. The contact calls Mr. C back, says, hey, so-and-so and so. After that encounter, now I'm of course speeding up because we don't want to, we don't want to have part one, at, you know, be like an hour long. But the bottom line was that we got the track within a, a few days. I said to myself, this track cannot sound like every other serious voice track that I have recorded. It has to stand out. It has to be different. But you got to hear my voice. You got to know it's serious voice, right? Like my energy has to be on there like from the jump. And so I set out to be a Christian on this track. And for Christians listening... Let's just say I set out to be a Christian on a secular beat. I was going to ride this secular beat so that they could see that a Christian could ride the beat and it could come out dope. That was my mentality. Let's let, let, let's stop. I'm going to stop you right there. And I was actually having a conversation with someone um, about this recently that um, the problem with the organized church, I'll stress, not the body of Christ, the organized church. As a whole. As a whole. Yes. There are many leaders that are not educated on how the music game works. Right. First of all, number one. Number two, I will say this. I'm going to guesstimate that 70 to 75% of the music produced, mixed, mastered, beats created are not by Christians. Christians right. do not, most Christians are not engaged in anything production out there when it comes to uh releasing albums um you know releasing uh you know mixtapes uh you know basically releasing uh you know uh eps i'm not talking about the artist singing or rapping i'm talking about the 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 the, the bolts and the, the 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 nuts meaning the uh you know everything that is put together that make the engine go right many times it's people that are not saved and many times it's people that don't go to church that are behind the production and the overall, um, you know, creative, creative process of this music. So I just want to make that abundantly clear before we move forward. So, and, and also let's just put this out there. This is a fact right here. There's no such thing as secular beat or Christian beat. A beat is a beat. A beat is a beat is a beat. Like <laughs> this, a beat is a beat. And, but, but. I have to say this as a, as a minister, and, and I believe I have a little bit of discernment at my age, I got a little bit of discernment when I listen to a beat an instrumental, every beat has a certain spirit, a certain presence on it. Now, some beats you would say is probably like it has God is God breathed. I can say that I can go out on a limb and say certain beats are God breathed. I don't know if the beat maker knew that God was going to put something on that beat, but don't call me crazy now. And I don't want y'all calling me out, but I'm going to say this. Certain beats are God breathed. Other beats are just not. You got to, you got to put God on there. So as an artist, cause I've been doing this for over 15 years. So with that being said, Again, I'm going to state there's no such thing as a Christian beat, a gospel beat, or whatever they want to call it, and a secular beat. A beat is a beat. Mm-hmm. So a beat becomes what I make of it. So if if I'm glorifying God on a beat, okay, yes, it's a Christian song. Mm-hmm. Versus if I'm degrading a woman or a man or I'm talking down on a certain thing mm-hmm. or issue, then I'm not glorifying God. Right. Right. So we, the artists, determine what that beat is. So let's just get it right. So when people, people like they hear a certain beat, oh, that sounds familiar. And they're like, oh, they must be doing that devil. No, listen to the words, please. Like we don't have enough time on this episode to get into all of that. But let's just make certain things abundantly clear. There's no such thing as a devil beat, a devil's beat. There is no such thing as 
you know, Christians doing the devil's music. Now, of course, there's some people who have denounced Christ, right? And they've gone as far as publicly state that. Now, I'm not going to tell you to listen to their music. You have to determine if you want to continue to give an ear to what's out there. So getting back to the misconceptions or the beliefs of the church when it comes to dealing with mainstream music producers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, I believe it stems from that fear. There's a fear. Maybe this person really isn't saved. And that's why they're dealing with a secular producer, I'm gonna stop right? You, I'm going to stop you again right now when it comes to this. Because there's a lot of truths that need to be uh, told about how church operations work. When you go to most churches and you look at who's working um, the boards in their churches, who's playing the drums, who's playing the trumpet, do you really believe? I'm just saying, you know, as far as... A lot of these people that, that do a lot of stuff around the church operation, mm -hmm. not all of them are saved, Holy Ghost filled. They're not. That's the hypocrite. That's the that's why this part of what we're talking about is hypocritical. So if the organized church is gonna say, Well, you shouldn't be out there rapping on world stages, then you need to stop some of you pastors need to stop these people that's working your boards, that's working your cameras from doing their part of the operation and because, set them yeah, down because, because they're not Saved. And that's let's, the, let's speak what the truth and is. And that is what you said, the hypocritical part about what the church does. They will hire a drummer who just left the club. Yep. Right? Speak on and it. And he was turning up and he was helping hundreds of people turn up. They will hire a singer who everybody know has a drug problem. Everybody know is probably still on the drugs. They will hire, I'm, I, I'm not even going to get into it, but a rapper says, I'm a rap for Jesus. No, that's not I'm rapping tip. for Jesus that's not on tip. a Jay-Z beat or a beat that's, you know, a from blue, a from familiar, a familiar, a familiar beat. beat. They lose their mind. Well, you must not be saved because you're rapping on this Jay-Z beat <laughs> and, and, and he's married to a Jezebel. So we go into this whole thing. Mm -hmm. But the sad part is, Mr. C, is that what nobody is thinking about, what nobody's focused on is the next generation, the youth. And 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 from the time I, I've been saved when I was about 16 years old in my bedroom, from the time I got saved, the Lord has always put, you know how we say burden when Christians say, I got a burden for this. The Lord has always put a burden on me for young people. And that's why I do this thing called Christian rap. I don't do it because I want to be on the award show and I want to get an award and I want to perform and I want to be nominated. And I want to be this and I want to be that. I do it for the boys and the girls. I have a teenager who's listening to Metro Boom, Boomin' or whatever his name is. Metro Boomin'? Mm -hmm. Metro Boom. Right? He's listening to all these rappers out there. How am I giving him an alternative? So we as a community need to stress and perhaps need to do a series to educate the church. What really is Christian rap? What is Christian rap all about? What are these people all about? Now, granted, there are those of us, maybe that, maybe that 5%, or it might be as high as 10% who don't really live the life. They don't go to church. They don't have a pastor. They don't, they don't, um, they're not held accountable to anyone, right? There's that 10%, let's say, for example, well, right? His, 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 they're, they're a rogue and, 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 and they're running around as a Christian rapper. But what about the 90% that's praying, that's fasting, that's spending untold amounts of money so that somebody's son, somebody's daughter can keep walking and living in this Christian lifestyle, walking the right, a moral lifestyle, right? A moral um, lifestyle. What about these boys and girls? And this is why I created Kill the King. And so I hope that you guys will pause and just look at these little things that trigger us, which really shouldn't be a trigger. And perhaps we need to pray and say, God, remove these triggers because I can hear the heart of Sirius' voice. I can hear the heart of this rapper. I can hear the heart of this singer. Just because they're doing it on a familiar beat. Just because the beat sounds a little R&B-ish, that doesn't mean I'm telling your son or your daughter to go 
go rent a hotel room and have some fun for a night. I am not saying that, or that person's not saying that just because the beat sounds a certain way. What we are doing is saying, this is what we're saying. Since your boys and your girls, your sons and daughters are listening to R. Kelly, they're listening to whoever they're listening to. I don't even know these people because I don't listen to these people. They listen to um, Lil Uzi Vert. I just want to rock. Matter of fact, TikTok has them dancing and they don't even know what they're dancing to. They're listening to Beyonce. They're listening to all these people. We're saying, okay, Beyonce's music is on this level. Let me get my beat on this level and let me preach kingdom to them. Let me preach the gospel to them. Over uh, production with excellence. Yes. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the point. So let's work on, let's pray on these misconceptions, these false truths. Let's work on asking God to remove these thoughts, these triggers, because our young people, if we don't continue to produce the kind of music, the Kill the King songs that we're producing, guess what's going to happen? They're going to continue to shake their hips to, I just want to rock. And they're going to rock their hips right into hell. Somebody ain't going to like what I just said, but that's what's going to happen. So be very careful the next time you invite a gospel singer and they don't look the way you think they should look or sound the way you think they should sound and you kick them out. And what you're basically doing is kicking some boy or some girl into hell. That's what you're doing because we're the ones that have been tasked to minister to these kids today, not 50 years from now, today. And this is how we're reaching them because this is where they are. So when I say, how do I start the song? Kill the king. Kill the king. When I say, you want to know limits though? Then take up the limits, bro. Your idol is king. He got your reflections. You wearing his ring and God is a no. Go kill the king. When I come with that energy... I'm addressing your son, I'm addressing your daughter, I'm addressing your your cousin, your sister, right? I'm addressing them because that's where they are. They're hooked on social media, they're consistently scrolling. Their friends might be telling them, let's go get a drink. And next thing you know, the drinking has become a habit. There's no time for reading a Bible, studying scripture. There's no time for any of that. And so let's put these false truths aside, Mr. C, and let's focus on what we're really here to accomplish, to minister to the next generation, to teach them about kingdom, to teach them about Christ, to give them the true armor to withstand the wiles of the enemy. Is that not it? It's basically uh, the the goal and the objective um, each and every time um, we set out. And then I will say probably this last thing, because I know we're uh, pressed for time, that there's probably a two or three step thing I would like to say. I still see it today. I've been at, I've been at uh, different ministry conferences and I still see the gap and the battle that uh, some pastors are facing. Number one, some pastors are behind the eight ball on uh, the media front. I see pastors. Well, you know what I exposed. See pastors, I see pastors struggling to keep up with the conversation at these conferences when it comes to media. Well, listen, you know what exposed a lot of ministries? COVID. Yep. COVID. Yep. COVID. Yep. Oh, we can't go to the building no more. Because at one point, the general, the church as a whole was saying social media was of the devil. And it's garbage. They, they didn't and want, it, yeah, it's and garbage. It's, and it's how how are you gonna how are you gonna minister to somebody on social media? Well, COVID happened and you were forced to do what? Virtual church. You were forced to do every ministry and, had to figure it and out. And the one and the churches that were not media verse, they were done, and some of them have been done permanently. Right. Right? Right. And then so when they so I would say when some of these churches begin to catch up media wise <laughs> is then when they can begin to understand the rest. Right. Until they catch up media wise. Mm -hmm. And I dare I say social media wise. Yeah. Yeah. You have then to you're say not, you're not really. Um, how can I say this? You're not qualified to speak on this, this side of this, this topic. Right. I'm sorry. You're because, not. because, you know, and, and I'll say this, I know a 13 year old right now who uses TikTok for ministry and some people like her peers might laugh at her, but she posts TikTok to provoke people and say, are you a Christian? Every, every time she gets on TikTok, 
It's, it's, it's asking people that question. Are you a Christian? Why aren't you a Christian? Right. I'm not going to, I'm not going to mention her name. You know who I'm talking about, but, and this young woman, she calls herself my biggest fan. And the reason why I mention her is when I set out to, to create the beautiful deluxe project, I said, I want to make this for grown women, for adults. And that was the approach I took. But then I quickly realized that this 13 year old knew all the words to the original beautiful. She knew all the words. She knew all the songs and she was singing it. And even another minister's daughter, who I believe is maybe 10, his daughter knew all the words. So I'm like, wait a minute, I'm making this music for adults, but these kids are still listening. So I had to, I had to change my approach. I had to understand that they're consuming the music, the videos, et cetera, at a rapid, a, a, a rapid rate. But you have to understand, like when I was eight or nine years old is when I really started listening to hip hop music. It wasn't when I was 17, 18. So I'm listening at that time to uh, Sparky D. I'm listening to Roxanne Shantae at the time. I'm giving my age away probably. He's old. I'm listening to Run DMC right. as the time goes on. I'm listening to, um, you know, just groups I'm trying to think about. LL Cool J. That's grown folk music, right? But I was listening right. to it. right. You know, going to church with my mom on Sunday, going to church with my father when I came up here to New York on Sunday, but during the week. Monday, I'll, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Friday, Saturday. Had, I had my I had my uh, <laughs> my uh, my recorder on pause. Y'all know how I used to work some of y'all old school hip hop fans. <laughs> and then that Friday night mix came on with uh someone like DJ Red Alert. Yeah. Yeah. You take that you you take that uh, pause off because you know this my music gonna hit your tape. Right. Anyway, I'm not gonna get into it. Let me stop there. <laughs> So we're going to wrap up this, this episode, but stay tuned for parts two, three, and four, where we talk about, you know, what happens when Christians work with mainstream. And this was, this has been a very fruitful conversation and, and it's only part one and, and it gets so much more in depth and so much more, more funny to me. Mm -hmm. Because there's so many um, misconceptions, so many lies, and that that people who are saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, water baptized, believe, until you get to the place where God says, "I want you to work with this mainstream person," or "I want you to be on the Steve Harvey Morning Show," or "I want you to do X Y Z," because you're gonna be the light in that dark place. And the funny thing is your friends who happen to be Christians say, oh, you can't be saved because why would God tell you to go to the White House and shake the president's hand? And why would God tell you? So all of this stuff goes down, but you have to have your focus so laser that you say, I'm, never mind what these people are saying. This is what the Lord has told me to do. This is the path that he has set me on and I'm just going to move forward. And for me personally, that's how I feel because most of the stages that I've been on, 90, nine, let's just say 90% of the stages that I've been on have been secular stages. That's where I've thrived the most. That's where I've truly been able to minister at a high level. You know what I'm saying? Um, and, and my gift is not the same gift as someone else's because other people might be meant for the four walls, but you've known me for 19 years and you know that my gift is not meant for the four walls. Right. Um, the Lord has done so much. So we're going to end here. We said we were going to end like two minutes ago, but we are going to end here. Thank you so much for popping in, Mr. C. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. <laughs> Pledge is all mine. All right. He really didn't pop in. He's always been here. I've been? Never mind. He's always, he's always been here. <laughs> all right, folks. Catch you on the second episode. Peace. I'm killing the king. Cause without God, I am nothing. Charlotte weapon on that girl. No more dead girl walking. I killed the king with my lips. Now I'm talking. Living in power. No 50 cent. I'm the dollar.